my experience reading Freakonomics was atypical. I, I, after investing in a handful of, of independent films, I couldn't help but come away with how cinematic uh, I thought the book was. There were so many interesting stories to explore that it appealed to me immediately, uh, not just as an, an incredible groundbreaking book, but as something that I wanted to, to learn more about and explore in different ways. So I wasn't sure that I'd be involved, but I, I thought, someone's going to make this into a movie, and I can't wait to go see it. So I just reached out and uh, found out how the process was progressing. There was already some interest, and it, it evolved from, from there. Um, I, I think that what the, maybe the epiphany moment was when I thought the best way to handle the material was to bring in, uh, in, in my mind, a superstar documentary filmmakers to each take on something controversial or interesting in the book, or maybe something that emerged after the book came out. And it was a long journey, but if it was realized uh, exactly as I imagined, it exceeded that. You originally you had how many seconds? Six you were talking about? Was that always the number you had thought about and then you went back down to four? Or have, talk a little bit about the process of this and maybe see if you can jump in and talk a little bit about your, your both the author's participation with this and conceptualization of this. Sure. I I've talked about how I started assembling the team, and originally we were going to do six segments, but we had we had directors that, that we had identified that either had, had uh, conflicting projects or just couldn't make the numbers work. Uh, the brilliant filmmaker Laura Poitras at one point was going to do a segment. John Nujim, another incredibly talented filmmaker. We talked with Spike Jones. Had, he, had, had there been uh, an opportunity to schedule to make it work, he would have done a segment. We also wanted to make sure that we didn't make this too heavy, uh, with too many segments and it would become tedious to watch. And, and after we started to work through it, it, it this felt like the right balance. Uh, so um, from my perspective, it was uh, easy, because we didn't have to actually do anything. These people did all the work, and they put our name on it, and it makes us look much better than we actually are, <laughs> which is always a good thing to have. Um, we, we did have a lot of people approach us when the book uh, came out and started to do well to want to make you know, any and everything. Uh, you know, coffee cups and slide rules and <laughs> freaking out action figures, yeah. Actually, action figures. Uh, and, uh, yes, exactly. Very exciting, very exciting. Reaching for the wallet, putting the wallet back. So we, we, uh, we uh, you know, we met with some people and it was, it, plainly there was a big brain divide between us and them. Not smarter and dumb, but just like we saw things very, very differently. And, and I shared, most people's um, idea that this was not material that was well suited for any screen, large or small. That things needed to be explained in a certain way that the page can really do well. Obviously, I was proven extremely wrong, because I think it's a phenomenal film. I, I think all these folks did amazing work. When I met with, so Chad approached me, you know, wrote some emails, and he sounded a little bit different. And uh, I remember where, do you remember where we went to, uh, to E when he was in New York? Went to this place where uh, I'd once written about that I'd been served a piece of extremely rancid chicken in this place. And, uh, and, and then it posed this kind of behavioral economics quandary of what to do about the bill and how to try to navigate my way down to zero. And I failed. I failed miserably at it. But I got an article out of it. I wrote about it. So I hadn't been back there in a couple of years. And I, and I went there with Chad because I liked the place. And I, I felt bad that I could never go back. It was a French roast on the Upper West Side. Uh, <laughs> uh, about 80 in the on the east side, <laughs> and uh, French roast, and, uh, and I went and I thought, if we go and I have uh, lunch with this guy, Chad, who sounds really good on email, and if he's good in person, and if neither of us get food poisoning, that's an omen. <laughs> and, uh, everything worked out great as a meal, and what I realized about Chad is he's a very, he's, you know, he's humble, so he's not going to say the things that he's really good at. But he was really good at seeing that the film could be finding great talent and getting in the pocket of these talent and persuading them to do it in this way. But honestly, from the minute that we uh, met and talked about it, I had no problem turning over the name of our book to these folks to make a movie, which, I, and I tell you, I wouldn't feel that way about the vast majority of people in the world doing it. So for, uh, for me and Levitt, who had to go home, uh, it's his daughter's birthday, he was here last night, uh, and he said hello. Um, it was a, it was just a phenomenally good experience, and to see the stuff translated so well. Seriously, show of hands, how many people actually have read the book? <laughs> yeah, but can I tell you something? We do a lot of work on uh, you know the difference between survey answers and reality. <laughs> 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 Did you read it? 
cover to cover. <laughs> you didn't read, you read it? it? You didn't read the book. <laughs> guys, directors, how did you guys come in and then figure out who did what? You know, which segments? Talk a little bit about the process of it. Seth, you did the wraparound and all of this and the interstitial stuff. Let's start with you. Well, I had uh, joined the project pretty early on with Chad around around really the time Morgan agreed to, to join. And I, I, wore, who's not here right now. I wore a, a producerial hat through the process and I was hanging back to perhaps do a fifth segment if necessary. And then it, we realized as the process evolved that maybe what we needed better is a through line to stitch the movie together to kind of give us a, a headquarters or a home base through the film and also to find a way to get some of those great anecdotes from the book that weren't necessarily a full chapter into the movie, like the real estate bit and uh, you know that bit on polio. And that, that story about Amanda came out of nowhere during our interview, and that just had to be in it, because it's just a wonderful uh, potty training lesson. Um, so I, I, I think it was, it was a really organic process, which was really interesting to be a part of, because I think each of the filmmakers was off on their own doing their own thing, couldn't measure the progress of the other chapters. So the sense that this thing was real was actually elusive. <laughs> like, what are we doing, you know? Which troubles you as a documentarian anyway. But that's sort of times five in this case. So, and then it all sort of came together uh, last fall, I guess. We, we cut a trailer before the film was finished to help give us all the sense of what in the world we were doing. And then Tribeca's, uh, you know, commitment gave us a deadline and, you know, much I, deadline. a much needed deadline and it was finished Thursday, Chris, <laughs> literally like three days ago. Was, uh, <laughs> <laughs> several of us I saw it for the first time day. last night. Well, a lot of us saw it for the first time last night. So. Tell the truth, three hours ago. We had <laughs> the right. Yeah. Well, and Chad, so when you were recruiting filmmakers, did you, how, how did you start out? You went to Seth, you started running people you knew, then, you know, Chris, you guys want to talk about this as well, the process of bringing people in. I'll do that part really quickly and then hand it off to those guys. I, I, I met Morgan Spurlock at a festival, um, and, and we hit it off. I hadn't yet optioned the material, but he, he was cavalier yeah, enough. What does that mean? Yeah, exactly. He was cavalier <laughs> enough to just hear the pitch idea and what I had in mind, and he said, I'm in. Uh, you know, and I, so I can tell people that if we do this, you'll be one of the filmmakers. He said, absolutely. So that's what started it. And it, with, with, each, with each meeting, I was able to kind of put together this incredible team. Uh, I went to Alex Gibney right away. Uh, Seth was originally going to be my, my producing partner, uh, and he played, as he said, a, a, a producing role throughout the evolution of our film. So Seth, you were recruiting people as well. Then. Well, and they did a lot more work in that way. And they, uh, he'd always ask my opinion, and all everyone on this panel, I, def I loved their films, you know? I mean, and some that weren't here today, too. I mean, I, it's such a great and, and you guys, Chris, I mean, and you guys, before, you I want to hand over, this is a, and I'm sorry, this is an important part of the process. Uh, Alex suggested Heidi and Rachel, I'd seen Jesus Camp and loved it, and met with them. And this is how, how truly organic the process was. They not only said they were interested in, in directing, they're the ones that introduced me to Dan and Chris, who really put it all together. It's the difference between having a great idea and executing that idea. And, and I, I really value the creative process, that you need people who can actually get things done. And they held that role. So Heidi and Rachel not only directed, were instrumental in that introduction, and we had one other investor in the project, and they introduced me to him secondhand. So they not only took on uh, the, the role of director, they also made these crucial introductions in the development of the film. Um, so we had a lot of people wearing multiple hats in this project. Heidi? Uh, I didn't think it was naturally cinematic. When, they, when uh, Chad had the idea, of course I had, had uh, heard of the book, had not read the book, cover to cover or any portion of it. Uh, so Rachel and I said, well, we'll read the book. It's interesting. Obviously, we know, we know the title. And I was writing all over the margins of the book. How the hell do you make that visual? Uh, that, that's interesting. But you know, what do you do with data? And sort of really trying to figure out a lot of things. A lot of the ideas spoke to Rachel and myself. And um, I'm not a parent, but I've been to Park Slope. And, and <laughs> Um, so I always wondered, um, you know, does good parenting matter? Does any of this matter? Is it just a racket, you know? So that kind of spoke to Rachel and I about how do we, you know, develop a segment um, sort of based on that. But we do observational filmmaking, and we, we try to stick with cinema verite. So we weren't sure that we, we could be part of the film necessarily after I read the book because we wanted something to be unfolding in front of our camera as it happened. We wanted to film something whereby the audience, ourselves, or the economists didn't know how it was going to turn out. Yeah. And of course, in Freakonomics, you know, you need to find out the punchline. It's, 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 so it was a
conundrum for us. So we went to, we talked about it with Chad, and we told him a few ideas, and so why don't you talk to Steve Levitt? So we went to Chicago. We said, Steve, what are you working on that's interesting that you let us in on? And we're interested in parenting and kids and yada yada. And he said, well, we're, we got this investor, and he's given us hundreds of thousands of dollars to play with, and we're going to go to Chicago Heights, and we're going to pay ninth graders to get good grades. And it starts, you know, on this date. And we were like, we want to do that. And he said, well, I'm in. And he said, it could totally fail. And I don't care. I, I care. I mean, I want to try it. And, um, you know, well, if it doesn't work, we'll keep trying. And he was totally transparent. And I thought, what famous person with, you know, I guess he's got nothing left to prove. But I was very impressed that he would let our cameras in on an experiment that was really, he was unclear if it would, would be a success or not. Hey, Chris, Dan, you know, why don't you guys talk a little bit about the process of doing this and actually execute? Go ahead, jump in. Well, I, you know, we, we were introduced to to Chad, I guess it was about two and a half years ago now. And, uh, and the project at that point was, you know, the commitment from all these directors and this great idea. Um, I think that, you know, the last two and a half years. How did got her segment? How did, how did everybody get their segments? Oh, well, I think each director came to the project with an idea about what they wanted to do. Um, there was a, like Chad said, there was a point at which we were considering uh, bringing on you know, our fifth director in the last year here. And so, you know, we, we were out to a lot of people, and I think we ultimately made the right call in, in limiting it to four segments. Uh, but, you know, making a project like this, there are uh, legal, logistical, financial, uh, political challenges uh, to putting something like this together, and that's you know, kind of where we fit in. I think creatively, this time last year, we, Chris and I were out talking to you know, industry people and distributors about what the film was going to be, and they would, they would ask us this question about how this film was going to ultimately cohere, and we would say, well, there are going to be these interstitials that Seth Gordon is going to do, and they said, well, describe the nature of the interstitials, and we would, we would, you know, tap, we would tap dance there and say, well, it's going to be animated, and, 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 and I, I think we would have kind of sold ourselves short uh, if we had limited the interstitials to what we had in our heads, because what Seth did is really kind of came in the end here and, and saved all of our asses with what he created. Uh, uh, yeah, and he deserves a lot of credit for that. I mean, you know, a, a, the filmmakers had a lot more time than he did to, to create their segments and really craft them. He was thrown into the <coughs> fire here about two months ago, I think. Is that when you started, more or less, in earnest, like doing this? You did this. Uh, yeah, well, my, I had a baby February 4th, so it was the weekend after that. Yeah. <laughs> and then so until today. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Yeah, well, and while a lot of the filmmakers came to their, the parts that they did a little more organically, you know, Alex Gibney grew up in Japan. He really had um, a lot of interest in that subject matter and a lot of background. And then Morgan Spurlock, I think, had just had a baby and really was interested in doing the parenting segment. But Seth got sort of saddled with the most difficult job and absolutely no time and a hard deadline and, uh, and really you know, produce the material that makes this feel like a film and not just sort of a, a group of five shorts. Uh, you know, Eugene, I'm a little bit like Stephen. I, I read the book and I say, how do, you, how do you do this? You know, how do you make it, how do you really make it work? It's, it's you know, there's a, a lot of elements in the book that make it really interesting, including its cerebral qualities, its, its questioning and and real detailed issues and some of the theoretical issues. Some of that gets on the screen, some of it doesn't. Did you, you you're an old academic, you've got, you had some doubts or questions about how you're gonna do your segment or talk about I mean, it? My segment in particular, because it was about such a sensitive issue. Yeah. And because my first reading of it, long before there was the idea of doing a movie, I had read it and I thought it was an interesting twist on It's a Wonderful Life. Right. That was my first instinct, just because I love It's a Wonderful Life. I seem to make no movies that don't refer to Frank Capra, so it's becoming a, a trend. And I had, when they brought it up as an idea of doing a movie, I wanted to do that section, and I wanted to play on that issue of what life looks like when a person is not born. And the fact that in today's America, unlike in Capra's America, it, we've gotten to a point where life can be better if you're not born. It's a horrible reflection, and because it's a horrible reflection, and it means the erasure of people on screen, I didn't want to erase humans on screen, I wanted to erase cartoon characters so that we could think about this sort of in our own little snow globe rather than in real life with all that emotional baggage. We could look at it in practical with practical implications rather than you know human issues. And so mine was a very simple, necessary solution. I also had the blessing of having a wonderful 
young animator who, was, who had just joined my company, Joe Posner, and it was a great opportunity to do something that he could really shine in and they could really make a dent on this issue and sort of revive it. We have seen what's happened in Oklahoma this week and around the country with abortion policies. There's an op-ed in the Times today that there's much greater support for uh, upturning Roe v. Wade than before. And I wanted to re sort of rekindle the thinking about this on sober terms and animation help. You know, the see then the issue again of, of what you talk about when you you know talk about this film. Are there things and I pretend these guys aren't here. Are there you're things, gonna, you're are there gonna, things yeah. you want in the film that aren't that isn't in the film? Oh, the things you want in. You, oh. you said you love the film, but are there stuff that you would have wanted to see framed differently? Or um, uh, that's a great question. I I don't you know um, I'll be honest. It's I'm like the worst person in the world to ask that, and I'd say let it be second worst, because um, <laughs> when you're in the material, the way we've been in the material, I mean, basically, uh, Steve Levitt, a bunch of the whole bunch, along with a whole bunch of other very, very good academic co-authors over the years, um, who really deserve a ton of credit as well, Sudhir Venkatesh and Chad Severson on the real estate, and on uh, John Donahue on the Roe v. Wade, these guys spent years and years doing a certain kind of empirical storytelling. And then I came along and with Levitt created a different version of storytelling here. For me to kind of assume that I could then translate the way they do, I just have no, you know, I, I, my wife is a visual person, she's a photographer. And we have, we've been together long enough now where we know our limitations. And she says, you're a word person, you do not get it. I'm good with certain sequential <laughs> things, with certain logic things and so on. And my wife with spatial things and relationship things and visual things, I am just incredibly handicapped in that regard. <laughs> so for me to say this is a piece that would work well in this regard, I just am physically, intellectually incapable of doing it. Right now I've started to do a radio show, which I find is a kind of good format for me because I can't have the picture to show people, so I have to thread it through orally. And I find that, that in the way that like a third grader cannot do calculus, that's perfect for me. And I can kind of walk people along by the hand, but to tell a story visually, I think it's a totally different set of skills, so I, I don't know. You know, there may be a natural affinity between documentary filmmaking and, and Freakonomics. You know, it's, it's about idiosyncratic behavior. It's about understanding how, as you say, do documenting or you know, formulating and framing what, in fact, people do. That said, I can't imagine pitching this to anybody without a book. You know, I mean, if you chatted taking this to somebody, you know, the guy that just bought this movie and went up and said, hey, I've got a great idea for you. We're going to talk about questioning everything, you know, the academic presumption. We're going to do something. We're going to do a, a really wonderful documentary on behavioral economics. Where do we go? Right, it doesn't get made. Yeah, and so it doesn't work. And so in event, you guys had to get that done even as a book. That was an amazing, I can't imagine that even the, the authors, you know, the publishers of this originally oh, thought this yeah. was going to be somehow don't, a commercial don't get, phenomenon. Don't get me started now. Uh, I mean, Yes and no. I mean, to, to tell the truth, I mean, what happened is I wrote this article about Levitt's work, which I personally found interesting, and I was sure that all of eight people would read it. I wrote an article in the New York <laughs> Times Magazine, and it, I don't know whether this was just timing or intentional, but it ended up coming out in early August, which if you write for magazines, you know, you don't want anything coming out in August because if people are going to the beach, and here's like an eight-page article on an academic research economist, and you're sitting there and you've caught like no chance. And so I was sure it was going to be the biggest dud of an article, and, and my fear was confirmed when the first phone call I got, and the only phone call I got on the day it came out, was from Levitt's mom back in Minneapolis. <laughs> and I was like, oh God, that was the biggest waste of time my whole life. And I, I turned out to be very wrong. And then publishers were interested because, you know, they're kind of trained to be interested in certain articles. And Levitt, they approached Levitt and me ultimately about writing it together. And, uh, and you know, he's an economist, I'm a journalist, we're basically both prostitutes. And uh, we decided that if, if they could come up with a figure that was just like a boatload of money, we would do it. But we didn't think it was a good idea. Levitt's dad told Levitt that it was immoral to sign a book contract for this material. He said, this is, your research is so uninteresting, he said, <laughs> to take a bunch of money from people and have the book fail, and you know it's going to fail before you do it. It's immoral. <laughs> so, um, but all this is a way to say the publisher did offer a boatload of money, which shows that they had some uh, confidence, maybe ill-placed confidence, but confidence that the book would do well. So, And then Levitt's sister, by the way, I just want to say, the record, Levitt's sister, whose name is Linda Gines, um, named the book, and we had no name. It was a book about nothing, and, and we're totally convinced that about 90% of the success of the book is due to the name. 
<laughs> she, uh, you know, we, like I said, we had this manuscript. It was, it, we joked that it was like the Seinfeld of books. It was just about nothing. <laughs> and, and, and the publisher's names, the titles that the publisher came up with, one was just worse than the next. And ours were horrible, too. And then we gave the manuscript to Levitt's sister, who had worked in publishing a little bit and advertising. And she came back to us with a list of like 200 names. And one was like, um, Bend It Like Veblen. <laughs> so, exactly. So when we saw Freakonomics, Levitt and I, we both laughed and we thought, this is so bad that it's actually maybe good. And the publisher was dead set against it for about six months until it was the end of time. And there was no time left and they said, what the hell, let's do it. And honestly, I mean, I think, you know, even though we write that names for children don't matter, there's a big difference because a child you encounter once, but then you keep running into that person, their name wears off. A book or a title of a product like that, you don't get so many chances. So I really think that was a huge thing. Even when you die, what it's going to say, and you're okay. Yeah, absolutely right. right. And hopefully, I don't do anything bad between now and then. So. <laughs> you know, the, the issue of, of filmmaking for so many people has always 